Congressman Sherman. Okay, so we have Congresswoman Caitlin Long, who's pro crypto, and she's been to the IOHK summit down in Miami, Florida. And I see her on Twitter a lot. She says a lot of a lot of things that are pro crypto without being totally in the bag, and she does a very good job. But Congressman Sherman is hostile towards crypto. So if you want to be tribal, why don't you you know write this guy a letter? So anyway, what he said is. Um, an awful lot of our international power, now this is a U.S. congressman, he says an awful lot of our international power comes from the fact that the U.S. dollar is the standard unit of international finance and transactions. Clearing through the New York Fed is critical for all major oil and other transactions. It is the announced purpose of the supporters of cryptocurrency, us, to take that power away from us to put us in a position where the most significant sanctions we have against Iran, for example, would become irrelevant. So whether it is to disempower our foreign policy, our tax collection enforcement, or traditional law enforcement, the advantage of crypto over sovereign currency is solely to aid in the disempowerment of the United States and the rule of law. A congressman said that. What do you guys think? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, we know that both both ends of the spectrum are always going to have intense biases, right? And if you look at, you know, really, if you look at the the entire ethos of what he's saying, it is money talks, so let's not devalue it. Ultimately, I look at initially, why would someone in this position say something? in that in that vein right first place you look when you look at a politician no matter what topic or issue you're talking about it's always who donates money to this person some of his main donation relationships come from people in the traditional finance market i think one of them i cannot recall the name of the company offhand but it is a payment processor and they deal with you know um business to consumer transactions and business to business transactions, I believe, from what I read. If that's the case, the main use cases for crypto is just that, taking the fees out of those sorts of processes. Why would they have an interest in getting crypto out of the way, right? But ultimately, if you think about this in the exact same way, when the stock exchange in New York moved from pieces of paper pinned up on a wall and tiles being moved around over to a computer, people said that this is a way that the most powerful and technologically savvy people are going to game the common folk out of their money. And all this anarchy is going to occur because we're giving all this power to the mean internet and the, the computers, the machines are going to take over the world. And it's the same alarmist sort of behavior that you see you know, and to me, without even looking at the politics, it's all about the fact that it should be about education and helping people understand what the technology is, what it means, why it's important, and cutting out the noise on both ends, cutting out the noise from the hate side and cutting out the noise from the people who say that blockchain and crypto is going to solve world hunger, because that's not the way it works either. You know, there's a, a defined use case, there's a defined value. And it's never, it's never black or white. It's always gray. Yeah. And that's a great opinion to have on it. And also along with that, my, my take on it is I think this congressman is conceding that cryptocurrency, it could be a superior form of currency. He doesn't come out and say it, but there's some sort of fear in the background or he's being tribal himself by saying, Hey, this is my US dollar and I think it's more important than crypto. And I think we should outlaw that crypto over there because I don't like what it does and it undermines the US dollar. But in the bigger picture, the guy who really gets it is Ron Paul. Like Ron Paul, I remember listening to him back in 2004, 2006, 2008 timeframe. And he, he always talked about the US dollar having this significant trade advantage and a power advantage because it was used as a world standard. Mm -hmm. And when the U.S. does trade with some countries, there's a huge trade advantage because if a country A wants to trade with country B, they might have to go through the U.S. dollar to get there and get a proper transaction. And um, I think he's afraid of losing that. 
I think he's afraid of losing that that trade advantage where I think that's probably just an old fashioned way of looking at things, because if you have a better way of doing it, you know, if you have a currency that can serve as an international currency and establish a baseline that is not tethered to a country's interest, I think that's a better currency, not just technologically wise, but socially and culturally as well. Right. And I think it goes, it goes far beyond the idea of, of only the value of a currency. To me, you know, I, I'm a, a, you know, I was born in the United States. I love this country, I've lived here my entire life. You know, I have all the passion in the world for the United States. Ultimately, though, I find it offensive and myopic that people either attribute our, you know, level of status in, in the global scale to only our dollar and our guns and our military, right? I think this country is so much more than just that. Right. And so when you say as a congressman, our world power is derived from money or from our military, all you're doing is offending and de detracting from the actual value that we offer besides that. So I think that's really where where my head goes is if that's all our country has to offer to you, then I don't think, you know, America very well. That's just my opinion. Yep. And he said oil too. He's got oil in that sentence. So you can't leave out the big oil thing. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right though. The dollar has, um, yeah, you can argue that it's starved a lot of other countries currency because it's supposed to be the one world or the one that dominates everything. So, you know, uh, we see it with hyperinflation in other countries around the world and it's, it's directly tied to the U S dollar. You know, we're going to fall last, we will fall last, but there are other countries that are much smaller that don't have everything, um, put together economically. They're going to be the ones that fall first. I'd like to go back to one of your points that you were saying at the end, um, Forrest, you were saying about how, you know, there's a fine line. It, it doesn't it doesn't have to be to polar extremes you know blockchain is not going to solve world hunger or it's not going it, it shouldn't be looked at or the dollar shouldn't be looked at as the standard for everything and we can find some kind of middle ground right. and i think that every other every cryptocurrency and every blockchain project you need to make sure that you delineate get the head out of the clouds and see exactly what this project can do because we're no different than the dollar if we think that we're just going to have this one cryptocurrency project rule everything because what's the difference what's the, i mean i just don't see the difference and whoever got in first is going to be the ones that rule just like the right. the dollar system so the fiat system and there's a lot of animosity towards this statement whenever i say it but ultimately i find the approach that people take to evaluating a cryptocurrency project and, and I'll, I'll go through the exact process. It is, look at a cryptocurrency. Is it 100% decentralized? If no, I don't want it and I hate it, right? I'm sorry to report to everybody, there isn't one. None of these projects are fully decentralized. And I am the biggest advocate in this space. I will be in this space till I take my last breath. But I also don't believe that human beings right now, socially, socioeconomically, are ready and comprehend the types of changes that have to occur in our society for an actual decentralized solution to occur and to be sustainable. If you look at the Dow hack in 2015, perfect example, all the people on Reddit, all the people online are saying this is a great decentralized world computer that we're on. You know, look at this venture capital startup, the Dow, they're setting up this whole thing where they can invest in companies and create this huge fund with no central control. It's like a community. Little did they know the smart contract was built with huge holes in it. Reentrancy hack occurs and 50 million goes missing in a matter of hours. What did people do in that? In a decentralized environment, you have to throw up your hands and say, this is a mistake we all hold responsibility for. But that's not how it worked. People looked at Vitalik, please save us because all of our money is gone. And then that whole, you know, rollback, the reorg occurred and we have a, a fork. What did the people do? 
they looked to a central party, an authority figure, to fix the problem. And if we want to talk about a decentralized world, that type of behavior from people should speak to how ready we are for that. In my, in my humble opinion, and I know people hate it when I say that, but ultimately that's what's going to have to happen. A lot of stuff has to change. That's a very rational point. Very rational point. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see any flaws in that argument whatsoever. It's uh, the people that are shouting decentralization to its fullest. It's only because they haven't lost their money yet. If they're not the ones affected, then it's all right. But, right. you know, and if I they lost the value, I understand the value of that. And I talk about it on my channel. It's where it, this is the distributed decentralized movement. I'm about that. And that's what I love as well. But I also am trying to be pragmatic about it and understand what can we reasonably get out of this as a society in the short term, because there are things that are going to take generations to, to modify behavior. You know, it's the same way that um, you know, generations before ours in the late 19th century, for example, had no understanding and no concept of the fact that they could ever step foot in a state a coast away. It just, it didn't really, it didn't make sense to them because they didn't have that means of transportation. Now, if I say, I want to just go and take a quick trip over to, you know, to Chicago, plane, train, automobile, and I'm there. They had no clue how that worked and commerce followed suit. Commerce was really small. And, and so again, with the internet, people were like, well, I'm just limited in what I can understand because I can go to the library and read books, but I can't search. It takes me time. And now kids know more than the most educated people did in, you know, times long before now. So it's, uh, it's going to take time for humans to catch up to the tech that we're building.